Author, teacher, and speaker Chris Putnam has a diverse range of interests. His interests in the Bible and theology have driven him to serious study and analysis. He has earned a Master of Arts degree in Theological Studies from Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary, a certification in Christian Apologetics from Biola University. In addition to his Bachelor of Science in Religion and Mathematics and Biblical Coursework at the Koinonia Institute, uh, and by the way, Chris actually earned his medal, unlike some of us. Uh, in addition to serving on the praise team, he enjoys the privilege of teaching the Bible at his local church. Chris enjoys engaging the public concerning the relevance of biblical faith and maintaining and contributing to the Logos Apologia website. I would highly recommend that you make a regular habit of going to the uh, uh, Logos Apologia website, which I was familiar with even before I knew the author over here, Chris Putnam, of that website. Uh, he is also the co-author of the recent bestseller, Petrus Romanus, The Final Pope is Here. And uh, we learned from Barnes & Noble, by the way, when their national religion buyer called me, that if the distributor had not messed up and not let Barnes & Noble even know the book was coming out at the same time other buyers were buying the book, that it would have hit the New York Times bestsellers list. Uh, but we believe that God's in control of all of this, and there could be reasons for why that happened, but it is still an international bestseller. Uh, and I can tell you that Chris is actually the one that contributed all of the solid theology. I added a bunch of fluff, and we called it a book. Uh, Chris believes that no matter what happens in 2012, we should take the message of that research very seriously. He's currently writing his next book, tentatively titled The Supernatural Worldview, and I can also let the cat out of the bag that he and I are going to release a kind of sequel to Petrus Romanus. Uh, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that. Like I said, I don't want to steal any of his time, but it is going to be on the Vatican ET connection, and we're going to finally answer some of the questions that the public has been wanting to know. Uh, we hope to be able to have that done by the end of this year. Uh, besides that, Chris is a bloodhound as a researcher. He is a serious apologist. And most important, he looks like Superman. Oh, boy. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Button. Well, hello, hello, everyone. It's, it's a blessing to be here. Uh, these are the two books that, that I have made a contribution to. This other one is Pandemonium's Engine, where I actually uh, address the issue of transhumanism. Believe it or not, there are Christians who are endorsing uh, transhumanism, and, and I took them to task in, in that volume. But enough of the introduction. Um, I believe that most of you here today are, are keenly aware that events in the world, and especially in Israel, are screaming the lateness of the hour on the prophetic time clock. And I think that's why we're gathered here. Now, if you only remember one thing from my presentation today, it's that there are a variety of prophetic traditions and biblical interpretations that are all pointing to the same period of time that we're in today. Now, the likelihood that that is all just a coincidence seems pretty far-fetched to me. Um, so my objective today is to talk about two rather obscure um, prophecies and two and biblical interpretations that you might not be really familiar with. Now, if you've read our book, you probably are. But particularly, I'm going to talk about the St. Malachi prophecy of the popes and the historicist school of biblical interpretation, which actually dominated the field of prophetic studies for four or 500 years, and it's largely forgotten today. Now, I think as a result of that, that, that you'll be affirmed in your faith, and you'll be better prepared for what lies ahead. And I think that we're all looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, just want to make a couple caveats before I start. I'm going to talk about some dates, but I'm not a date setter. I, I don't claim any knowledge whatsoever about when Christ will return. I want to make that perfectly clear. Um, I'm, as an apologist, I have publicly, you know, criticized people like Harold Camping and things like that. I, I do not advocate moving into a bunker and 
you know, expecting the rapture uh, this year because it's the year 2012. So I just want to dispel that notion right off the bat. The other thing is, is I'm not meaning to attack Catholic people. Okay, I, I love Catholic people, and I think that they are a great mission field because a lot of them still need to hear the gospel, even though they're in a church that calls itself Christian. But there's a difference between attacking ideas and attacking people, and I just want to make that distinction right off the bat. Um, you know, there's huge problems within Protestantism today as well, and you know, to me, I think that's exactly what we would expect given the prophecies in the Bible, that we would expect to see a falling away from true biblical doctrine. So when we think about Bible prophecy, we always usually think about the future. And today I'm going to challenge that notion a little bit and, and offer the idea that we can actually learn a lot about prophecy from, the, from history as well. Now, Christians live... We all live in what biblical scholars call the already but not yet paradigm. Now, what this idea refers to is that when Christ came the first time, he instituted his kingdom on earth. You know, one of the first things he says in the Gospels is the kingdom is, is here among you. Um, but, you know, it also teaches us in the Bible that the world is under the control of the evil one, under the control of the devil. He blinds the minds of unbelievers. The book of 1 John says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So this is the not yet part of the paradigm that I'm talking about. So the kingdom is here, and, and it's in us. It's in the church. And when I say the church, I mean the invisible union of blood-bought believers not a building or an institution, not a sacral system, not a state church that works by coercion. And unfortunately, this is what we've seen through church history. Even in Protestantism, there have been state churches and, and coerced. And, that, and coercion is not Christianity. Christianity is about belief. So I think that when we look at, the, at church history, there's a few pivotal events where we can see that Satan has made a move to infiltrate the church. And it only makes sense that we're, we're in this tension between the two advents, waiting for Christ to return. The church is here as ambassadors trying to pull people out of the darkness, that Satan's going to try to infiltrate that and destroy it and pervert it. And I think that we can see some clear-cut instances of that, but based on this history... And this peculiar prophecy by an Irish saint named Malachi Morgare, I think that this data is suggestive that we could see the biblical false prophet come on the scene very soon. But before we get into details of that, I want to take a look at some instances of prophecy in the Bible. Now, who delivered this prophecy? A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. This is the prophecy that led the Magi to Bethlehem when Jesus was born. Does anybody, can anybody yell out the name of who the prophet was? Balaam. Balaam, a sorcerer hired by Balak, a Moabite king, to curse Israel. Okay? This guy is not a Jewish prophet. He's an evil sorcerer. He goes down in infamy. The book of Revelation talks about the era of Balaam. Um, but what's interesting is that God used this fella to deliver a prophecy that led the Magi to Bethlehem. Doesn't that seem like an unlikely choice? Who delivered this prophecy? In the days of these kings shall God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It's talking about Christ's millennial kingdom at the second advent. Now, this is from Daniel. Daniel, these are Daniel's words. It's Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. But Daniel's interpreting the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, an arrogant, narcissistic Babylonian king that thinks that he's a god, okay? Now, isn't it odd that God gave this dream 
to this Babylonian king. So the, the point I'm, I'm getting at is that prophecy is often very strange. Um, like another example would be Pharaoh, who had a dream of skinny cows that, that Joseph interpreted, right? And that, that's what brought his brothers to Egypt. So the point that I'm trying to make is that God uses unlikely characters at times, and we see this in Scripture. And so this is one of the part of my thought process when I, Tom and I decided to look at this Malachi prophecy, because I'm not a Catholic, and I don't have really any reason to accept a Catholic prophecy. I, I believe the Bible, you know, I believe Bible prophecy, and that's what my main interest is in. But we, we found this thing very curious, and I think you'll see why. But... So here we have this character, Malachi Morgare. He was born about 1094, 12th century, and he's the Archbishop of Armagh, his district of Ireland. And this was about the time that the Catholic Church was coming out of the darkest pit of the Dark Ages. So he did institute some very well-needed moral reforms. The church was very corrupt at this time. Um, he was um, credited with healing King David I of Scotland's son uh, from a deadly disease. So he was ascribed to many miracles and the gift of prophecy. He's also said to have predicted the long battle between the Irish and the English that didn't end until the 20th century. But of course the prophecy that we're really interested in looking at today is his famous prophecy of the popes. Now as the legend goes, Malachi made a journey to Rome from Ireland around 1139 AD. And this would have been a quite an arduous journey at this period of time, if you think about the way conditions were in the 12th century. And he had to go up through Europe and then down to avoid the mountains. Um, now, you know, at the end of this long journey, he has a somewhat frustrating meeting with the Pope. Um, but they, what they tell us is that he went to a hill called Janicum Hill right outside of Rome. And at this point, he had a vision. And I, you know, I don't know exactly how this works, but apparently you know, he saw a vision of all these symbols, and he wrote down a list of 112 little Latin phrases to denote particular popes all up to the end of, the, end of time, to the tribulation period. The thing that's particularly interesting is that we are happen to be at number 111 on this list of 112. Now, this prophecy has some vagueness to its origin. Between 1139 and 1595 AD, no one really knows where it was. And for this reason, if you go on the internet and do some research on this on yourself or read the Wikipedia page, you're gonna see a lot of criticism where they say that it's a forgery. And I spent a lot of time researching that when we started this project. And at, at one point, I almost was about to give up on it because I really didn't think there was anything to it. I thought that perhaps somebody created it after the fact and made it look like it, it was really a prophecy. And that's probably true with some of the earlier parts of it. And I, I present that case pretty clearly in the book. And, one of the things that that doesn't address is the fact that it's indisputed that this thing is in print in 1595 in this massive book called Ligum Vate. Um, so that was widely distributed. Nobody disputes it. And so we have all these prophecies after its publication. And the thing that is very intriguing is that they are surprisingly accurate. And we're going to talk about that. But just to get a feel for how it works, we're going to take a look at a few of them. This is the one that made the decision for me. And I'll tell you why. If you think about science, and, and I've had some science in college. I, I was studying to be an engineer at one point and worked in the computer industry. But when a, when a scientist makes a hypothesis, the scientific method is, is that he designs an experiment to try to falsify it. So the way that you test a hypothesis is you, you make a risky prediction. And if it, 
if it meets the prediction, it confirms the theory. They, they seldom use the word proof in science, but they consider it a confirmation. But something that, that doesn't really make a risky prediction, like frankly, some of the, the predictions in this Malachi prophecy, that they're, they're not that risky. They're, they're very vague, and it's hard to tell if it really was fulfilled or not. But this one, this is the uh, prophecy religio de populata in Latin. And it, it really just means religion depopulated in English, okay? Now that's a risky prediction because given the normal ebb and flow of history, we would just expect that the church to kind of go on as the way as it always has, you know? Also, if the church had grown, you know, if there had been a revival or, or something like that, this would be falsified. So we, we wouldn't expect this to happen. So it's a rather risky prediction. Now it happened to fall in the years 1914 to 1922 during the pontificate of Benedict XV. And what do we see that happened in this little brief period of time? We had World War I. And this is devastating to Europe. It's devastating to the Roman Catholic Church. To add insult to injury, this is the time of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Scholars, they think that probably 200 million people left the Russian Orthodox Church to join the Communist Party. The ones that didn't leave, we have the writings of Lenin and Stalin where they specifically target religious leaders because they saw them as an enemy of the state. Someone who lives for something higher than the state Someone who lives for God, that obeys God, is going to stand up to the Communist Party. So they targeted the church specifically. So Stalin alone is credited with killing 43 million people. The Soviet Union is probably one of the greatest mega murderers in history. And this is exactly when this Malachi prophecy says religion will be depopulated. Now that's not vague. And that, to me, seems like a supernatural prediction. Now, here's another one that Paul VI, he's Pope from 1963 to 1978. Now, his motto is flower flowers. Now, this is a match to heraldry. Now, what heraldry means is simply the coat of arms. And this is a big deal within the ancient world and in the Middle Ages, and especially in Roman Catholicism. Now, his coat of arms, you'll see it has these three things they call a fleur de lis, and that's the, the flower symbol of the French monarchy. And it literally translates to flower of the lily. So here we have a pope. His coat of arms has three fleur de lis on it, and the, and the prediction is flower of flowers. Now, like I said, I, I took a kind of a skeptical methodology when I was examining this thing when we were working on this book. And, you know, my first thought is, okay, you know, you're, you're a Roman Catholic guy. You're, you're working your way up. Everyone kind of knows about this Malachi prophecy thing. You know, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll, just I'll make my coat of arms look like the next one on the list, right? And, and then they'll think that I'm, I'm, I'm the de chosen one. I'm destined, right? Um, but... That doesn't work because it turns out, I studied heraldry a little bit to examine this and they actually have to choose this when they become a bishop, it's a requirement. When you're a bishop, you have to have your coat of arms. And a lot of these guys become bishop like 30, 40 years before they're ever elected pope. Now, the, to be able to anticipate when the next pope's gonna die and, and to match your motto up with that seems pretty far-fetched. So it, that doesn't seem to be the case that they just fixed it. And so there's a, quite a few of them that match heraldry. And um, that's why it's kind of important. If you look at the prophecy, many of them are very descriptive of the coat of arms. Now, Paul VI gave a little known speech. This was in the 60s. And um, we're taking a little side diversion from the prophecy of the popes because I think that his speech was very prophetically significant. Um, this was in 1965 at the United Nations, and, and I'll just read this little bit where he says, we would almost say that your chief characteristic, he's talking to the UN, is a reflection, as it were, in the temporal field, in the worldly field, of what the Catholic Church aspires to be in the spiritual field, unique and universal. Is there anyone who does not see the necessity of coming thus progressively to the establishment of a world authority available to act efficaciously on the juridical and political levels? Now, this speech is 
very interesting because Bible prophecy predicts a world government in the Old and New Testaments. Daniel chapter 7 speaks of a fourth, fourth beast that devours the whole world. Now that really was speaking to the Roman Empire in its first incarnation, but we also see that it comes back. And so Bible prophecy scholars have been watching for a revived Roman Empire for a long time. Um, the book of Revelation, chapter 13, speaks of a world ruler with power over all kindreds, nations, and tongues. Now, will a future pope make Paul VI's dream with his speech to the, to the UN, maybe make, make this ambition a reality? Perhaps. Now, this appeared just at the end of June, June 20th. Like I said, prophecy scholars, you'll, if you read J.R. Church's writings, you'll probably see him mention a 10-nation European Union. Um, many dispensational commentators have been writing about this for decades. And I don't know if this is exactly it, but I found this very intriguing. 10 EU foreign ministers have met, they're talking about reformulating the European Union into a 10-state system. Now, based on Daniel 7 and Revelation 13, uh, like John Valvrude, who was the president of Dallas Theological Seminary, wrote extensively about this, and I have an article about it on my website right now, logosapologia.org, where I even quote uh, Valvrude's commentaries, and Hal Lindsey wrote about this in The Late Great Planet Earth. Um, and it seems like this event right now is making what they wrote about a reality, and it's happening right now. <laughs> This was in late June that I saw these articles. So back to the prophecy of the popes. John Paul I, he was pope in 1978. He's famous for one of the shortest pontificates in history. He only lived 33 days. There was one pope that lived 12 days, so he probably has the record. But a lot of people think he was poisoned because they, they, they embalmed his body within 24 hours and didn't do an autopsy, and that was really against Italian law. But the Vatican is actually not under Italian law. It, it has its own law. It's actually a sovereign state. As far as his motto, he was born in the Diocese of Bel Luno. Now, the prefix bel in Latin means beautiful, and luno means moon. So quite literally, he came from the beautiful moon. But to make it a little more interesting, he ascended to the papacy during a half moon. And he really, really only lived one lunar cycle. So most people think from the midst of the moon speaks to when he ascended to the papacy. John Paul II. Now he's the pope that we probably all remember. Uh, he was pope from 1978 to 2005. And uh, there's some that would argue that his motto from the labor of the sun might hearken to some of the leftovers of sun worship that are still within the Catholic system that in, came in during Constantine. But I think what it's talking about is in the Latin, you could, you could really translate from the labor of the sun to be from the travails of the sun or perhaps from the eclipse of the sun. He was born during a solar eclipse. Okay. I went to the NASA website. I've, I've verified that these things were true. I didn't take somebody's word for it. And then he was buried during a solar eclipse. That seems to be beyond human control to me. And the prediction is from the labor of the sun. Benedict XVI, our, our current pope, his motto was glory of the olive. Now, the Catholics that really believe this prophecy and follow it closely and try to predict the next pope, they were all for, for decades thinking that the next pope was going to be from the Benedictine order. That's because the Benedictine monks use an olive branch as their symbol. So everyone was expecting a Benedictine. When Cardinal Ratzinger, when he was elected, they were all disappointed because he's not a Benedictine monk. He happens to be born on the feast day of St. Benedict, but then he chose his own papal name. They picked their own papal name, and he, and he names himself Benedict. Now, that seems like a self-fulfilling prophecy to me. 
And there are other examples in history where particular popes have done things to associate themselves with this Malachi prophecy intentionally. Now, the fact that that's a self-fulfilling prophecy, still it's fulfilled, okay? And it's really odd to me because you do see ones that, that seem like they were manipulated that make them fulfilled. And you see ones that are so vague that you wonder if that really counts. Okay, and, and I acknowledge that, but the ones that you can explain are the ones like religion depopulated, okay? And so when you put them all together, it still kind of coherently is coming true from different ways. Now one of the other things about the Benedict thing is a lot of th people think that perhaps the olive reference could be hearkening the Olivet Discourse by Jesus which we are all probably familiar with where he talks about the end times. And I think that we see the birth pains that Jesus talked about, the wars and the rumors of wars and the earthquakes and the famines and those things. I think we see them coming closer and closer together. So some people would associate his motto of glory of the olive with perhaps a, a reference to the Olivet Discourse. But here is why Tom and Horn and I were attracted to this prophecy in the beginning. And, and this is why we wanted to write about it. Because this is the prediction for our very next pope. Okay, Benedict turned 85 in April, so it's not long. This is what this prophecy predicts. It says, in the extreme persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will nourish the sheep in many tribulations. When they're finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed and then the dreadful judge will judge his people, the end. Okay, that's not vague. <laughs> that's not vague at all. And, you know, right off the bat, a few things jump out at me when I look at this. I mean, I see words like persecution, many tribulations, the city of seven hills is going to be destroyed, and, and judgment. Okay, I, it doesn't take a prophecy scholar to, to see that this is talking about the tribulation and the end times. Um, the, what really jumps out to me as someone who studies the Bible, though, are the amazing parallels to Revelation chapter 17. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast with names full of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet cover and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, this is a painting by William Blake that hangs in the British Museum. And it just kind of gives you an idea of this apocalyptic symbolism that, that John was writing. This hideous beast and this great harlot that rides the beast. But even so, I think the book of Revelation is, is pretty good about defining many of these symbols for us. And the ones that aren't actually defined in the book of Revelation, you'll find a lot of them defined in the Old Testament. And if you ever study the Bible with Chuck Missler, then you'll, you'll, you'll get more than an earful about what all of them mean. Chuck is a great Bible teacher, and I've studied a lot of his materials. Um, now this, what, what I really find particularly compelling with the Malachi prophecy and Revelation 17, the city of seven hills is a very transparent reference to the city of Rome. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia identifies Rome as the city of seven hills. Now, Revelation 17, with this great harlot, here is a mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. You know, Bible scholars all pretty unanimously will, will say that is a reference to Rome, which was you know, where John was dealing with when he wrote this book. Now, if that wasn't enough, I think that John makes it really clear. At the end of the chapter 17, he says that the woman is the city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Now, when you interpret the Bible, I mean, a lot of people want to impose their meanings onto the biblical text. The way that you get away from that, the way that you can sort of hold the truth of the scriptures in is you try to stick with the author's intention. The original author's intention is what it means. 
what he intended his readers to understand. And when John was writing this book and sending it to the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, this was at the, the height of the Roman Empire, okay? And the city that had dominion over the kings of the earth was Rome, and everyone knew that. So I think that that's what John intended by that. Here's a lesser known but very interesting piece of evidence that we can use to identify the great harlot. It's called the Dia Roma coin. And this was a coin that was in wide circulation um, at the time that John wrote the book of Revelation. The goddess Roma is the deity of the city of Rome. She was also seen as a mother goddess. And she was also known as the queen of heaven. Okay, for that reason, I, I make an argument in our book that the entity, I think that some of these ancient gods are actually real entities, that they are fallen angels, that there might be you know, something tangible behind some of these deities. And I think that this could actually be the entity that's behind the Marian apparition phenomenon that the Catholics are worshiping. So this coin was minted around 71 AD. And it was in wide circulation. So the point of that being is that the book of Revelation is written around 90. And it was delivered to these churches in Asia Minor. You know, Ephesus, Thyatira, Smyrna, Laodicea, all those churches. And um, you know, these guys would have been familiar with this coin. They would have had this image in their mind. Um, and what, what do we see on this coin? Well, the goddess Roma is sitting on the seven hills of Rome. Okay, that's where she's sitting. Over here, I don't think the laser pointer will work on the screen, but on this side is the river deity for the river Tiber. And down here are the twins, Romulus and Remus, who are the mythological founders of the city of Rome, and they're actually being nursed by a she-wolf, which is how they're, the myth of the founding of the city of Rome goes. The, the letters S and C are just Latin that stands for a Senate resolution. The goddess is sitting with a military Roman skirt and she has the Roman sword on her knee. Now this would have been pagan Rome, but the Roman sword, it also says that Mystery Babylon, the great harlot, is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And this is a sobering coin. We're gonna look at another coin. This is a papal medallion, okay? It's um, minted by Gregory the 13th, and it, um, right above Gregory's head, it says Pontificus Maximi, which is the name of the high priest of the pagan Roman Empire. And the popes kind of just borrowed that title and appropriated it to themselves. But what this, what this medallion com commemorates is the slaughter of the Huguenots in 1572 on St. Bartholomew's Day. On this day, 70,000 Bible-believing Christians were slaughtered by the Roman Catholic Church. And they were brought in under a ruse of toleration. Um, the king, they, they invited them to a cathedral to, to sign a peace agreement. We're not gonna, we're not gonna fight anymore. We're gonna accept you, in, you know, as, as another church. And as they showed up, they got picked off one by one, and it went on for days. Now, I've seen Catholic apologists argue, well, that was the French monarchy, and, they, and they, they perpetrated this. But when the Pope heard about it, he threw a party. He had a hymn of praise song, and then he printed, had this medallion made. And if you look, if you can see it, I don't know if everyone can see it, but there's dead bodies laying all over the side of this, back side of this coin. There are Bible-believing Christians. And I have a hard time believing that this, this Roman Catholic system is of Jesus Christ when it's slaughtering people for their faith in Christ because they don't want to ascribe to the sacral system under their thumb. Now, let me go back. This is only one instance. And this has gone on throughout history. And I actually wrote down a quote. Chuck Missler has a pack briefing package called the, uh, the Kingdom of Blood. And it came out back when uh, the book A Woman Rides the Beast by Dave Hunt came out. So I'm not the first person to talk about this, and I won't be the last. But Chuck, 
phrased it in a way that I thought was interesting and kind of clever. He, he said, Innocent III murdered far more Christians in one afternoon than any Roman emperor did during his entire reign. Millions over the centuries simply refused to align themselves with Roman Catholic heresies, dogmas, and practices were martyred for their faith. There's a trail of blood behind the theology and the freedom that, that we have today in the American church. The fact that we can get together and have churches that believe what we want to believe and read the scriptures as we want to is a, is a privilege that many people gave their lives for, not just at the expense of the state or the pagans, but against the Roman Catholics. Um, so is this just a Protestant idea that I'm getting at when I'm trying to connect the Catholic Church and Revelation chapter 17? And no, it's not. And um, here's some Catholic opinions. This was a Jesuit priest named Manuel Diaz Lacunza. And he was very unsatisfied with the allegorical interpretation of Bible prophecy that was predominant in the Catholic Church during his day. This was the early 19th century. Um, so he sequestered himself away in a room for like two or three years with just the Bible, with just the scriptures in their original language. And he decided that he was gonna study prophecy and, and determine what, he, what the scriptures really said. Now, at the end of his study, he concluded that the phrase, the day of the Lord, actually spoke to when Christ returned, the Jews were converted, the earth, that Satan was overthrown, and then Christ would set up his millennial kingdom on earth. Now, what I'm telling you that for, for many years, the interpretation that most of us here believe, um, people didn't believe that. They didn't even know about it. And he's one of the first people to recover it. He was a Jesuit. Um, it's very interesting. Most of his influence is, will, is so seen today but here because the dispensational interpretation of the Bible that most of us hold owes a lot to a book that he wrote called The Coming of the Messiah in Glory and Majesty. It was very influ influential to people like John Nelson Darby who inspired the Schofield Reference Bible. And it's all worked all its way up through J.R. Church and Gary Stearman and, and Chuck Missler. And this is the view that, 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 that most of us here hold. And, and I do subscribe to that view. I'm gonna talk about some different schools of thought, but my principal view is the dispensationalist interpretation. But his book was quickly banned by the popes and put on the pr list of prohibited books because he put the Catholic Church on the wrong side of the battle of good and evil because just from what he read in Revelation 17, he saw that great harlot as, as Rome and, and he recognized that there would come a time when they would be opposed to God. Now here's another highly influential Catholic theologian and Archbishop of Westminster. His name is Cardinal Henry Manning. He came to very similar conclusions. He said, some of the greatest writers of the church tell us that the great city of Seven Hills, the city of Rome, will probably become apostate and that Rome will again be punished. For he will depart from it and the judgment of God will fall. So this is a major figure in the Catholic church, Cardinal Henry Manning. He sees the parallel in Revelation 17. Here is a Jesuit scholar, Father Malachi Martin. And I put his credentials up here because some of the things that he has said are so explosive that you would want to just label him maybe some kind of nut or something. But this is a, a very serious man. He's a, he's a serious scholar. He has doctorates in Semitic languages, archaeology, oriental history. He studied at Oxford and Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And from 1958 to 1964, he was an advisor to two popes. He was an insider. He was also an exorcist. Now, he was released from certain portions of his Jesuit vows in 1965 so he could write books. What he wanted to do was to expose a group of heterodox Jesuits that were promoting Marxist liberation theology, mainly down in South America, uh, communism, basically. He actually wrote in his book about the Jesuits that there was a state of war between the Jesuit order and the papacy. Even more astonishing, Martin wrote about a cabal of Satanists within the Vatican. Martin describes 
a satanic cabal that conducted a ritual for the enthronement of the fallen archangel Lucifer. And this occurred in 1963. The ritual seems to be keyed on the pontificate of Paul VI, who I just read the New World Order speech from. Um, he also stated that the availing time had begun. And later on in the same book, he, he wrote about the purpose of this ritual. He reveals that the purpose of these Satanists within the Vatican was to transform the papacy into a willing instrument of Satan. They call him the prince. And just to read this quote, henceforth the life and member of every phalanx, now the phalanx was this group that he was talking about within the church, in the Roman citadel was to be focused on the transformation of the papacy itself. No longer was the Petrine office to be an instrument of the nameless weakling, and that's what they called Jesus. It is to be fashioned into a willing instrument of the prince, Satan, and a living model for the new age of man. Now, this is a Jesuit scholar, a Vatican insider, okay? This is not Protestants that are anti-Catholic. This is a dedicated Catholic scholar reporting that there's a group of Satanists in the Vatican have done a ritual to change the papacy. So what I'm getting at is that it's not off on the fringe for Tom Horn and myself to postulate that a future pope would be the biblical false prophet. Catholic scholars have written as much themselves. In fact, if we take them seriously, that's exactly what we should expect. It comes from their own sources. The book of Revelation describes the false prophet as coming from the earth having horns like a lamb and speaking like a dragon. Now, of course, this is symbolic language. This is apocalyptic genre, as scholars would say, but I think that this language is very suggestive. Now, I'm probably pushing this one too far, and I'll just go ahead and admit it, but um, <laughs> I think the horns, I mean, some biblical interpreters would see this two-horned beast that's spoken of in the book of Daniel, perhaps, in the two horns, but, um, you know, Horn in the Bible, if you, if you look at scholarly sources, they'll say it's a symbol of power in a very gentle way. Now, this is just a little speculation, but if we look at the evolution of the papal miter over time, around 1125, it starts to have a little set of horns. And, and, and all they did is they spun it, okay? The horns are still there. They just it's, it's spun the way, other way around. So if you actually look at, look at this thing from the side, <laughs> it really does look like two horns. And I don't know, you know, I don't really know how prophetic visions like John had on the island of Patmos work. But, you know, I get the idea that they're kind of got a swirling sense of all these symbols, all these headed beasts, you know. Maybe, maybe the, the horns actually press into reality. I, I don't know, but I just thought that was kind of intriguing. Um, now, the rest of these symbols are, are pretty obvious. Uh, like a lamb. I think we all know that, that the Bible calls Jesus the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, right? That, that one's not very vague at all. And, you know, what, how does this apply to a pope? Well, the pope claims to be the vicar of Christ. Now, this Latin word vicar literally means instead of or in place of. So not only does he claim to be like the lamb, he's like the lamb, okay? He's probably the only person in the world that really makes this huge claim to be like the lamb. So the term vicar, quite literally, it, it translates to the Greek anti um, in, in, a, in a very uh, parallel way. Um, and this is one of the favorite arguments of the Protestant reformers, is that when you call yourself vicar of Christ, if you want to put that in Koine Greek, you might as well just say you're the Antichrist. <laughs> it, it literally works that way. <clears throat> Spake like a dragon. I think the dragon symbol is one of those that the book of Revelation defines for us very clearly. 
Um, and it, it associates the dragon with the ancient serpent. And we all know that that harkens back to the Garden of Eden. So when it says that this false prophet speaks like a dragon, I think it's very clear that it means he lies. Jesus called Satan the father of lies. But I think this um, serpent, you know, when we think about to the Garden of Eden, how did the serpent approach Eve? Did, did he try to tempt her into doing something overtly evil? Did he tell her to kill Adam or just, you know, do something crazy? No, he, he subtly twisted God's words. God, God said, you can eat of all of these trees except one. I'm just asking you to stay away from this one. Now, what does the serpent do? He totally twists that around. He comes up, did God say you couldn't eat of any of these trees? <clears throat> and make, it makes God seem so unreasonable. But this one is, you know, it, it's good for wisdom. <clears throat> My point is, I think this is exactly what popes do. Catholic theology twists the Bible to make it fit their preconceived traditions. It really does, and it leads people astray. I spend quite a bit of time in our book, Petrus Romanus, handling some Catholic doctrines and some of the things that they claim is true. And, and, and my whole strategy for doing that is I just compare it to the scripture say, this is what they say, this is what the scripture says. And, and I think I was pretty fair in the way I handled it, but I think the Pope is probably one of the biggest people that speaks like a dragon on the earth today. <laughs> Jesus' warnings, he warned us to beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing. So wouldn't we expect there to be people posing as Christian leaders that are false prophets? Um, and I think we would expect these to increase. And I just want to say that there, there are plenty of them within the Protestant churches as well. There's plenty of health and wealth and prosperity, gospel things that completely oppose. You know, the Bible tells us to expect persecution, to, to take the low place, to wash your brother's feet. And then we have preachers out here telling us we deserve to be first in line and drive the best car. And, you know, those things don't seem coherent to me. But some of the things the popes have said over the centuries are just over the top. And, you know, I could have gone back to the dark ages and pulled out some things that would just offend you and, and, and really blow your mind. But what, I, I'm, what I'm doing here is, is more recent material. And what I'm trying to get you to see is this idea of the vicar of Christ instead of Christ instead of God is not a fringe idea. It's really an instituted, solid doctrine of the church. This is Pope Pius the ninth, and he applied Jesus' words in John 10, 14, 6 to himself. I am the way and the truth and the life. Okay? This is the same Pope who declared papal infallibility in the year 1870. Not to be outdone, his predecessor, Pius X, carried on tradition. This was during an inaugural sermon that he delivered as cardinal. Now he boasted, the Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself under the veil of flesh, who by means of being common to humanity continues his ministry among men. They really believe this. Notice Pius XI extends it to the priest. The priest is another Christ. Again, that's really the, if you say that in Greek, in biblical Greek, it would be, he's an antichrist. So one might think that the more modernized version of Catholicism since the Vatican II thing might have changed some of this language or softened it, but this is John Paul II, the one that, that everyone probably remembers. And in his book, he wrote, the Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God, who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. Seriously, folks, this is very recent. This is very recent. Doesn't it sound like he's claiming to be God? He is. He is. He's claiming to be God. And, you know, given these boasts, is it too much of a stretch to agree that the Protestant reformers might have had a pretty good point 
when they applied this passage in 2 Thessalonians to the popes. He who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God and object of worship so that he takes his place in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. And if you read our Protestant heritage, I mean, from, from the time of, even before Luther, but certainly from Luther forward, for 500 years almost, everyone applied that to the papacy. But the first person that I'm aware to call a pope an antichrist was a pope himself. In fact, he is what a lot of people think was perhaps one of the last good popes before the papacy really took a turn. Gregory the first, the sixth century, very early seventh century, but he actually wrote this, that I confidently say that whoever calls himself or desires to be called universal priest is in his elation the precursor of Antichrist because he proudly puts himself above all others. Okay, he wrote this around 603 AD. The very next bishop of Rome, Boniface III, declared himself a universal priest in 606, the very next one. And in fact, this date of 606 is when many of the Protestant reformers believed that the reign of Antichrist began. And we're going to talk about what I mean by that, but they saw the Antichrist is reigning over, this whole, over a long period of time. Martin Luther, of course, is given credit for really starting the Protestant Reformation, and he unambiguously believed that the Pope was the true end times Antichrist, is what he wrote here. Now, this was a, a polemic that he wrote concerning a papal bull that had been written years prior called Unum Sanctum, and that is when the Pope actually said that it was necessary for every human creature to subject himself to the Pope for salvation. In other words, if you weren't in subjection to the Pope, you would go to hell. <clears throat> and this is the kind of thing that Luther was pushing back against. Of course, he wasn't alone. Uh, John Calvin, I could go through all of our famous Protestant leaders and, and quote you, but they only gave me an hour. And, and I, I cut out a lot of slides. Because I did have Calvin, I had a lot of other guys. Thomas Cramner was the Archbishop of, of, of Canterbury. And he, he reigned, he was in that position during Henry VIII, Edward VI, for a very short time, Mary I. And the reason why is that Mary was Catholic, and she has the name in history of Bloody Mary, because she slaughtered so many Protestants. So he, he, he wrote the Book of Common Prayer that, that is still in use in the Anglican Church today, and a lot of people still refer to it. Um, when Mary got a hold of him, <laughs> She, they, she had him tortured for a long time, and uh, he watched a lot of his brothers in Christ being slaughtered. And as he watched this happen, they told him that he would rec recant his Protestant theology and his beliefs, and he, he agreed to do so under this duress. And so they scheduled him to give a speech right before they were going to execute him, where he was going to denounce Protestantism. And uh, you know, it was all scheduled, and he went up there. And right before they were going to kill him, he, he stood there and he said, As for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and Antichrist with all his false doctrines. So he recanted on his recantation. <laughs> he was burned at the stake within minutes. So he died as a Reformation martyr. And the thing that I, I want you to understand is, you know, I'm not trying to just demonize Catholics, but this history is very real. I mean, this is our heritage, and a lot of people have forgotten it. The evangelical church today is, is largely ignorant of a lot of this history, and there's a big push to, to reunite with Rome, and, you know, and I understand. I like, I know some Catholic people that I like, and, and I agree with them on abortion and a lot of political issues, and I don't want to fight them, but, I mean, at the same time, do we take four or five hundred years of this sort of thing and just forget it and pretend like it didn't matter? You know, I don't think that's right either. In his commentary on the book of Revelation, John Wesley, the father of Methodism, 
Uh, he wrote that the beast with seven heads is the papacy of many ages. The seventh head is the man of sin, the Antichrist. He is a body of men and an individual. Now, the thing that I like about Wesley's interpretation is a lot of these reformers were just dead set that the papacy was the Antichrist, papacy was the Antichrist. They didn't really take account of the fact that that verse in 2 Thessalonians is speaking about a guy that Jesus defeats. So it has to be an individual in the future. And this is where I part ways with the historicist view. It can't just be all in the past because you know, Jesus is the one that defeats the Antichrist. So at least Wesley sees that there has to be an ultimate incarnation, you know, an ultimate final figure that, that Jesus is going to, to throw into the pit. You can't throw an institution into the, into the lake of fire, you know? He's talking about a false prophet and an antichrist as individuals. And Wesley was keen to notice that. So was Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon's known as the prince of pe preachers. He was a Baptist. Um, he was given a sermon about how the pagan Roman Empire was persecuting Christians. We all know the stories of the martyrs, um, the, the apostles that were killed. But in Spurgeon's sermon, he says, then the world changed its tactics. Instead of persecuting the church, it became nominally Christian, and Antichrist came forth in all of his blasphemous glory. The Pope of Rome put on the triple crown and called himself the Vicar of Christ. Then came in the abomination of worships of saints, angels, images, pictures, and then came the mass, and I know of what else, detestable era. Spurgeon had no doubt that the papacy was the Antichrist. He wrote about it extensively. This was not something they, they even questioned. So these guys all held what is called the historicist view of the book of Revelation. And that really means the way that they interpreted the book, they saw it as starting at the first advent and ending at the second. I think we have an alarm going off. <clears throat> so the whole span of, of church history would include the, the bowls, the trumpet judgments. I mean, they would see the, the rise of the Muslims and, and all these things come, coming in through the book of Revelation. And I don't know that, that I actually buy into that whole school of thought, but even us as dispensationalists do have elements of this in our thinking. If you think about the way that a lot of us probably interpret the letters in the book of Revelation, we see those as ages in church history. You know, we want to think, well, I'm in the, the Philadelphia age, or we're in the Laodicea age now where people are lukewarm, right? So that is really a form of historicism where we see eras in church history in those letters, and there's quite a few dispensational scholars that, would, that, that do believe that. <clears throat> now, one of the most famous um, adherents to that school of thought was one of our greatest American theologians, Jonathan Edwards. Now, Edwards really believed in the papal antichrist as well. Um, and what they did is they, they saw these 1260 days that the woman was chased into the desert by the dragon in the book of Revelation chapter 12 as 1260 years. They kind of did what we do with Daniel's 70 weeks where they made the day a year. So they saw a period of time for 1260 years where the real church was persecuted by the antichrist church, which they saw as Rome. So the 1260 days would be years in these passages. And this time times half a time would be the same thing where it would be year, year, two years and half a year, three and a half years, 1260 days. And then they extended that to the same thing. So this is how that interpretation worked. Now, this is an article I read when I was doing a paper on this in seminary. It's from a, an Edwards scholar from Yale University who said that, that Jonathan Edwards started the reign, that 1260 years, either at 606, that date that we talked about with Universal Bishop, or 756. Now, it's the second date that is more intriguing for us. Because if you add 1260 to 756, it lands you on the year 2016. Now, there are some scholars that argue that it happened earlier that. Some would say 751, 752. There was this deal between the Pope and King Pepin. And this is called the donation of Pepin. And I call it a Faustian bargain based on the tale of Faust who sold his soul to the devil. What happened was Pope Stephen made a deal with the Frankish King Pepin the Short. 
He used a fraudulent document, a forged piece of literature called the Donation of Constantine that said that Constantine had donated all this land to the church. He got King Pepin to go to war for him and slaughter a whole bunch of people. It made the pope a king. It made the pope a political entity. This happened, most scholars would say 756. So that's where we would start it. Now, quite interestingly, in the research for the book, I found a, a Presbyterian pastor, um, William J. Reed, and he wrote, this is in 1878, but if it began as it seems altogether most probable about the year 752, when the popes assumed all their proceedings in the style of temporal sovereigns, then it will be destroyed about the year 2012. Now, isn't that incredible? I mean, way before the Mayan calendar and, and all that kind of stuff, 1878, we have a prominent Presbyterian pastor predicting the end times in the year 2012. And this is not rare. Uh, Tom and I have uncovered at least 10 more commentaries from the 19th century that predict the period of time we're in right now. Some say 2012, more say 2016. <clears throat> now, in the research of this prophecy of the popes, I discovered a Belgian Jesuit. Uh, he worked at the University of Damour in Belgium. He wrote on theology and biblical studies. The book that I uncovered was called The Mysterious Prophecy of the Popes. It was written in the year 1951. He really believed this was a real prophecy. Now, he thought the first 70 mottos had been altered. And I talked about somebody probably monkeyed around with it. So he started the authentic part of the prophecy in the year 1572. What he did is he took that, that, the number of popes from 1572 to 1950 when he was writing and he divided it. He calculated the average reign of 40 popes to be 11 years. So 40 popes left on the list from 1572 forward times 11 years is 440 years. So if you add 440 years to 1572, you land on 2012. <laughs> now, Rene Thibault wrote in this book that was in print in 1951, he, he, he mentions the year 2012 over 24 times. He found all kinds of anagrams and encryption codes within the Latin text of this prophecy of St. Malachi, and he said 2012 over and over. This is how he ends the book. The year 2012 will show whether or not the prophet saw clearly. <laughs> well, I would take that and actually change it from St. Malachi to Rene Thibault, okay? Because he really makes a big deal about the year 2012. This book is in print in 1951. He died in 1952. The book went obscure. I had to have it dug up from the UNC Chapel Hill basement. And I, it was all in French. I translated it. Um, we actually provide a copy of that book. If you buy uh, Petrus Romanus from Tom, I think you get the DVD. I think Gary's store has it too, I hope. Um, we'll actually include a copy uh, of this text in French, and then I provided a rough English translation. Um, now, imagine Tom and my surprise then we saw that Pope might retire in April 2012, right as we were writing the book. Um, <laughs> I didn't know what to think. It didn't happen, but it really blew me away. Um, but right now, what are we seeing? Have, have you guys been hearing in the press the Vadilink scandal? It really looks like there is a lot of political posturing going on, anticipating the Pope stepping down or, or leaving office or something's happening. And um, it's really clear that this thing could come to pass. Now, I'm about to run out of time, but this is our number one candidate. Um, Cardinal Pierto Bertoni. He's the second in command at the Vatican. One of the other things that I uncovered was that in 1993 during the Oslo Accords, this, this guy, Mark Halter, reported that Simon Perez, who's now president of Israel, made a deal to turn over the old city of Jerusalem to the Pope. And this headline reads, Now Jerusalem give it, given sovereignty to the Pope. So... There's a Vatican agenda. Um, people will tell you right now that the Vatican is buying up all sorts of land around Jerusalem. Um, there's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of articles. Uh, these are a few that I pulled up. Uh, did you know that Bethlehem, the Church of the Nativity, is the first place ever put in the United Nations listed under the nation of Palestine? 
Yeah, it's not in Israel, it's in Palestine. And it's officially listed in the UN that way. Um, there's a lot of people talking about the Vatican is using the Palestinians to gain sovereignty. <laughs> um, and there's this, the hall of the Last Supper where King David's tomb is, is and supposedly where the Last Supper was. What Jewish people, reporters are reporting right now is that the Vatican has gotten sovereignty over that site, and it's on Mount Zion. So we know that the Temple Mount Faithful have laid a cornerstone for the third temple in 2009. And so what, will we, what are we expecting to happen at this third temple? I think this is where the Antichrist will sit. And I think the Vatican's making a lot of moves to be a part of that system. So it's, it's worth paying attention to. So this is the end of my, my talk. I think that just in a brief summary here, w that we can see that the Malachi prophecy seems to, to match up to Revelation 17. There are some remarkable fulfillments. Now, I'm not t telling you that it's for sure a, full, a, a real prophecy, but it's intriguing, and it, it, it is suggestive. Um, the, the false prophet is likely a future pope. Um, the historicist interpretation of the book of Revelation. We have Reformed and, and Presbyterian scholars writing for two, three hundred years, and, th and they're predicting the time of period that we're in right now. Um, the Malachi prophecy definitely suggests that it's imminent, and the Vatican definitely does have designs on Israel and is trying to make them come to pass. And so that's all I have, and I thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Thank you.